one, which is uh, it's it's kind of a play on what we call cat in a circle or cat in a box or cat in a star. Um, when we're running analyses, sometimes we run a, a catastrophic model within a different polygon, um, just kind of to see how you know things will play out. I'll get into that more in the, throughout this uh, throughout this presentation. Um, first things first, though. I'm Todd Barr. Um, I've been in the geospatial industry for way too long, 24 years as of this year. Uh, this seems like yesterday I was watching Arc IMS maps load after seven, I have to take seven hours to load, but here I am now. Um, I, most of my time I've spent in the defense and intelligence community, some emergency response. Um, I've done podcasts. I've both been a guest and a host. I was most recently on the most recent edition of the Mapscaping podcast with, uh, with Daniel O'Brien. Um, I also lecture at Northeastern University. I mostly teach on remote sensing and geospatial AI for uh, for the intelligence and for the intelligence studies degree there. Um, recently, the uh, the American Geographical Society lowered their standards and allowed me to be a board member on their um, uh, within that organization. It's 150 years old. We it's really neat to see how uh, how the different. It really brings together everyone from geospatial, from the academics to the government to the contractors, people in the in the hard private sector like myself, and kind of how we different and I kind of have different views on things. Uh, but my current role is I'm the director of geospatial products and solutions at Verisk Extreme Event Solutions. We're part of the uh, we're the subsidiary of the company Verisk. It's a Fortune 500 company that deal that basically pr we provide data modeling and data to the insurance industry. Um, and some to, uh, to government nonprofits, but mostly mostly the large reinsurers and insurance companies. Um, my job is really just to find where geospatial goes within our product line right now, looking for places where we can slide it in. I mean, I used to code and do analytics and, and you know database building and other things, um, but now I, I just really try to figure out where geospatial goes in the in the greater ecosystem of insurance. Um, it's very interesting, and I'll get into that as we go forward. But one of the neat things about working at, uh, at various Extreme Event Solutions is that we hire a lot of CSU graduates from the meteorology program to do our event modeling. So that gives me the that gives me the ability to uh, talk about all the restaurants I missed from when I from the time I lived in Fort Collins. Um, you know, Music City Chicken, the Mayor of Old Town, the Colorado Room, and of course you can't you can't go to the fort without getting going to the Rio, right? Anyway, let's let's dive into the actual let's dive into the actual presentation. So Great Britain plus coffee plus a fire plus tall ships equals what? And the answer is a $7 trillion, well, that's just a trillion, a $7 trillion global industry that is, um, I've never known how to really, because $7 trillion is astronomical, right, to anybody. And I never know how to visualize it. So it was either like how many times around the moon will seven will seven trillion dollars go? And the answer is eight thousand four hundred seven. If you put dollars uh, back to back, um, or thousand dollar bills next to a semi, so this represents seven trillion dollars. But and this industry is a data hoarder, so much so more than more than defense intelligence community, more than any other community I've ever worked in. We're looking for data for everything, and most of that and over. In the, 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 the wise tale is that 80% of all data is geospatial. In insurance, 95% of it's all geospatial. Outside of like like cyber insurance or other thing or a few other things, every all the in, all of this all insurance data has a geospatial context. From car accidents, where it happened, what were the road conditions, to um, um to you know, uh, massive cat models like the, what we do, even down to health and even down to health and well and uh, life insurance, depending on where you live, it affects your affects your health outcomes, right? But insurance really gets its start in the UK in the 1650s. Um, it really starts with coffee, of all things. So, in 1650, the first coffee shop opened in in the in Europe in um in in Oxford, and coffee slowly took over the continent. Or the, the the British Isles, they they thought it cured all sorts of things from sexual dysfunctions to gout to to sleeplessness. Um, and it's during this time he, the the coffee shops just really exploded across the UK. And in 13 years within London, there was over I believe there's over 600 or not 60 but 65 coffee shops in London at the time of the Great London Fire. 
which gutted the middle section of London, all the historic districts or all, all the all the business district and just every place every place where people uh, got together to do business. So after the London fire occurred, the business then need, needed needed a place to meet. Goods and services need to be shipped shipped in from from every, from all, everyone in the world because Britain doesn't really have that many resources. So coffee, wood, other things to bring bring in to help rebuild London, um, and all those things have a risk, right? Because back then seas weren't as as as, a, as safe as they are today. Uh, storms, piracy, cargo just falling overboard, or the rise of great old ones from the depths to destroy ships. All these things were on the on the table to to, to you know to destroy ships. So a number of ship a number of ship captains started to get together at a coffee shop called Lloyd's of London. Um, is this a basic coffee shop where the the first concept of of risk of um, protecting people in risk is, it was really was really laid out. Uh, this, this is where the underwriting and other things came from, where people would look at like a, a different track a different track for a writ for a ship, and they go, well, this is going through piracy, this is going through a possible hurricane track, this is going through this, this is going through that. So they scale the risk based on the geospatial location of the boats and where they'd be sailing to and sailing from. So that's really how insurance got its start. Is in a as after the Great London Fire, in a coffee shop in the middle in the in, in the middle of London, or the ruins of London at that time, I should say. And insurance and the over time, uh, the Lloyd's book put together something called the London the Lloyd's List. Um, the Lloyd's List is still available today. Obviously, not in paper form. It's mostly in a, it's a PDF and a website. But this had every boat leaving from every port that was coming in or out of London. So this this shows how much how much data was needed for the insurance and the, for the fuddling insurance industry to have to understand the different risk of the different of the different shipping and different and the different uh, products that were coming out of the, in out of the harbors. So insurance grew over the next three hundred plus years and kind of what it is today. And then you know moving forward we get to nineteen eighty seven. This is the year the Simpsons came out. This is the year uh, President Reagan challenged President Gorbachev to tear down the wall. And this is also the first introduction of what has become a meme of the Rick Roll, right? This is when Never Gonna Give You Up is actually released this is 1987. Also in this year, ins insurers and reinsurers uh, would, let, would do their geosp ge geospatial analysis on, on paper maps through, through push pins. Like if they look and see how their exposures, we have a number of exposures in Los Angeles, which is prone to earthquakes. So we need to balance that out with more exposures than say Cleveland, which didn't have as many high as many high risk storms or high risk perils. Or we have too many exposures on, in Florida where this where there's prone to be hurricanes. So we need to balance this out with having more um, um with you know with more exposures in Colorado where there are, or Colorado or like Wyoming where there aren't as many other enemies perils outside of a super volcano or two or some flooding. But compared to but compared to like you know your standard hurricane, that's really not that big. That's really not the big of a risk. And so this is kind of how the insurance company operated. The insurance industry operated at this point. Around this time in 1987, the Back Bay of Boston, a small company called the Applied Insurance Research Worldwide or AIR Worldwide, came up with a product called CatMap, catastrophe mapping. It was the first real use of geospatial information in catastrophic and catastrophic modeling, and um, and client and up until the cat map was released, the way um, where we could model hurricanes and model disasters and model catastrophes was insurance companies would figure out how much they lost in the, in the last major event in the last twenty years, like Hurric Hurricane Hugo in 1989 was a $4 million, was a $4 billion event or $3.5 billion event. So an insurance company we do before cap modeling, we just go, okay, this was this much. So we'll double that and have that in capital in case there's another storm, in case there's two storms that year. So we're not, so we're still solvent. So we don't disappear. And then, um, then Hurricane Andrew came along. Hurricane Andrew made land, when Hurricane Andrew was in the ocean, um, AIR worldwide, did an analysis and said it was a fifteen billion dollar event coming into Florida, and they sent their and you know it being this is nineteen ninety two, so it being nineteen ninety two they faxed their clients and told them their their predictions for and the estimates for the loss for this hurricane, and um, 
no one had ever even thought that it could possibly be a fifteen billion dollar event at that time. So a bunch of our clients kind of send them back information. It's like, uh, yeah, um, okay, but we don't we don't really believe it, basically. Um, so as over the and that was on Thursday. On Saturday, um, hurricane hurricane um, hurricane Andrew hit hit the west coast hit, hit the east coast of Florida at Homestead, Florida. It buzzsawed across the state. It did well over fifteen billion dollar in fifteen billion dollars in damage to, to hurricane. This is this is nineteen ninety two dollars, which is of over sixty billion dollars today. Um, that's basically the equivalent of an Ian from last year. Um, but it was a, it was a major storm. It caused a lot of insurers to go bankrupt. It caused a lot of insurers, to, you know, to, to not to, to basically lose liquidity, and really gave birth rise to the uh, to the reinsurance industry. It gives give it a bump. Uh, reinsurers are large capital banks, basically, that uh, support insurance companies by sharing the risk during a, during an event where they need to where they need to uh, be able to put out sixty billion, seventy five billion dollars after an event. So Andrew was really the um, the first real push into that. And so that goes into the question, why do we need cap modeling? As we, with Andrew, the insurance industry learned that the traditional methods of going, well, this hurricane was $5 billion, we just double that, uh, didn't really work anymore because the coasts, the coasts were changing, things were changing too quickly. The areas were being developed, areas were, areas were um, being built up. Uh, there was change in, like, the different, uh, in the different wetlands and hurricanes seemed to be gazing, gaining intensity at this time. So the constant changing landscape of the exposure data, um, you, you know, it showed the it showed the it showed the, it showed the lock the lack of, of of usefulness of past events or past experiences. Here's a uh, two satellite or two aerial images of Miami. Uh, the one on the left is from 1965, I believe, and the other one on the right is from 1998. So this kind of shows you how much things built up over those 30 years. Um, and and you know it, by by using the old methods of going through and like looking at and looking at previous um, previous hurricanes, how much damage they've done was it wasn't working anymore. So they had to use more data sets. They started using data from NOAA. They started using aerial imagery. Um, they started using you know actual uh, real uh, real time data events, real time and a real time understanding of what the hurricanes were doing by bringing NOAA data, weather service data, and other things. So this leads to the concept of cap modeling. Come on, there we go. So cap modeling has three has really three stages. The first one, the hazard stage, is the most geospatial of them all. Um, first, uh, so what we do within cap modeling is we create uh, catalogs, massive. We create these are all synthetic, but they're generated data. But we create 10,000 years for the hurricanes or earthquakes or tsunamis, 50,000 years or 100,000 years with, the, with those. We call those catalogs. And those create what we call similar stochastic events. So we have we create all these all these events that can simulate real world events. And then once we generate, like, let's say, the hurricane footprint or hurricane track, because those are simple, um, from there, we take that and we put in a wind footprint and a storm surge footprint for the local intensity calculation. And at that point, we had exposure data, which are geocoded locations, hotels, houses, construction units, um, you know, pools, whatever. Whatever the, whatever the exposure is, we geocode that onto the map. So we have an understanding of where things are and will there be in what could be the potential damage based on this storm. Um, the second phase is called is the engineering part. This is this is where the coding comes in, where it goes through the damage estimation. This is where you're bringing the policy additions and um, other sort of things. And then the final stage is the financial engine. And within the financial engine, that's where they compute by using the the contracts or the cedents or the um, um or the various um, uh, treaties that the uh, reinsurers have with insurers. This is where the um, how much damage or how much loss there's going to potentially be. So this is where the this is where the financial part comes in, where we gain an understanding of how much how large the storm is going to be, and how much damage it could feasibly do. So let's kind of look at, let's look at an example. These are a hundred these are a hundred hurricane tracks 
from our 10K uh, North Atlantic warm sea surface temperature catalog. Um, you look closely at them, I mean, it looks like a spaghetti map, right? But it's fun when you take like the full 10,000 year catalog and throw it into, into QGIS and it's just a giant blob of curve. Um, and if you look at some of these, uh, some of these storms, you'll see them doing loop de loops and things. It's it's interesting when you when you generate a bunch of random storms, what kind of what kind of tracks you actually get from the storms. Um, like with Dorian, like, I don't know if if you remember Dorian in eighty nine, or uh, eighty nine in uh, nineteen uh, when he, he stat when he just kind of paused over the uh, over Bermuda and just spun out for three days and moved forward from there. Um, we we didn't have a we didn't have a hurricane in our model that did that, so we had to uh, adjust our models a bit after after the after the Dorian event. But this is this would be the event generation. Second slide, and here we have the different stochastic uh, values within the uh, within the event IDs. Each storm is is uh, mapped out for every hour. These uh, small orange points are called hourly points. FEMA, uh, not FEMA, but NOAA does theirs every six hours. Uh, our our synthetic data does them every hour. So we, our synthetic data, we keep it as accurate as possible to, um, to, the, to the hour. And in the pop-up box, you can see the event ID. That's just the number of the, of the event in the, in the catalog. The hour of the storm where, it's, where, it's it, where it currently is making landfall, and that's hour 175. Most storms run for uh, anywhere from 200 to 220 hours. Um, and then the lat long, and then the current central pressure, radius of the storm, and the current wind speed, and the forward speed, and the current wind speed. And then, of course, the angle and the angle when it lands. From here, we can generate the event footprint. This is just wind speed. This one isn't, this one has a, when it make, obviously when it makes landfall, as you can see where it says number a one on the, on the storm icon within that, within that cat in the circle. Um, and then we have the various, then we have the color ramp for the, um, for the for the wind speed, as you can see, where it's making landfalls the highest between like you know 96 to 100, 111 miles an hour, and 74 and uh, 74 through 96. So we're looking at this with landing around a Cat three, but that's the assumed wind speed from this generated data. Now I'm um, I have to apologize for the next slide. It's gonna hurt your eyes. I used our web tool to generate this, and it randomly does the color of the um, uh, of the points for the exposures. And the the color and the color it chose was purple. I decided to go with it. Uh, it's a little harsh, I understand. Um, but this shows the in, what, where, where my exposures are within this particular county, and what wind speed they'll be in. This one, most of my exposures, this one will obviously be in a seventy five to seventy four to seventy a ninety six mile an hour wind uh, wind speed. So we won't be looking at a lot of damage. But by by clients running this analysis and looking at it. They can understand where they can be the most possible damage, so they can pre-position their auditors and their adjusters to go into the field. So after the event occurs, after the hurricane goes through, they can get on it and start pushing and start, you know, looking at the different look at the different damages, looking at how much damage, understanding how much loss there actually is. We also and to kind of wrap it up to look at the financial engine. We also can run the financial loss. This is aggregated at the state level from that same storm. Um, as this one shows, most of the damage will be done in Virginia, and that's right around, uh, you know, seven billion, eight, seven to what is it, six to six to eight billion dollars, basically worth of damage in Virginia, and the other one, and the other, and the other states, you know, maybe zero to one point one point five billion dollars worth of damage. So this storm, you know, probably landed at Cat Three. The one in the the one in the icon is, is our web tools. Um, um, cartography for saying that this is the first landfall. Some storms can have up to three, depending on where they go. Uh, storms that tend to make it across Florida and go in the Gulf, they become re-energized by the, the hot weather in the Gulf. And they'll, and they'll make landfall again. Like Katrina did that in, in uh, 2005. We just had one do it last year too, but wasn't as powerful. Um, so that's so we have enough, which, how many numbers of landfalls the storms have. But I believe they maxed out at three. But moving forward, you know, as this field grew, we started doing other catastrophe models, right? So that we have cat models for obviously tropical cyclone. We also have cat models for earthquakes. We have cat models for both flood and fire. 
moving forward, we have cat models for uh, for tsunamis, hail, and other uh, and other advanced storms, other large severe thund thunderstorms. And more recently, we've been getting into the cat to the to the catastrophe modeling of cyber attacks as well as space weather. Um, and all these catastrophe models over time have also began to integrate climate change data. The the science is still kind of out. It's not solid on how we can model climate change, but we're internally within a within a EES we're working on that, and you know we're working with universities and other and other organizations to kind of really nail down. But how to integrate climate change into our models and how to really dial that in? Because if we look at the number of, of of events over the past, and this is just the number of billion dollar events since 1980, as you can see, this has slowly been increasing. But there is a uh, but the main but the main uh, exposure points are Florida, Louisiana, and Texas, and somewhat in, uh, in Puerto Rico. But really, the the Gulf the Gulf Coast states are the ones that are been most at risk over the past. That's changing now with the with the advanced I don't want to say advances, but the increasing number of the wildfires in the morning. And as we encroach more into the WUI or the wild wildfire urban interface, we'll have uh, wildfires that grow to multi billion dollar events. Like the number of billion dollar events in 2022, we had 19. Um, most, of, you know, obviously the big ones were the, were, the, were the hurricanes that struck Florida, Fiona, Ian, and the coal. But we also had flooding in Missouri, um, ice storms in Texas, the wildfires in in, um, in New Mexico, and of course general drought and heat wave and central weather. Um, we predicted, or we estimated, the total loss in 2022 at 122 billion dollars worldwide, uh, U.S. dollars, and that is significant. Uh, it's been rising every year, and as that happens, there are more and more adjusters, more and more bandwidth, more and more energy put into uh, doing payouts for the insurance community. Right. So a new policy has kind of emerged called parametric insurance. This slide doesn't really do it justice, but what parametric insurance does, it allow it's it's completely based in geospatial technology and geospatial data. If you have an exposure, let's say you have a group of a group of hotels in, in Miami, you've worked with an insurance company to come up with a parametric a parametric contract where if the hurricane if the wind speed is over is a cat four, cat five, you have a hundred percent payout on your on your property. So let's say it's worth a billion dollars, you get a hundred percent payout. So you need a billion dollar support. If the if the wind speeds between if it's a cat three, you get a seventy five percent payout. If it's within like five miles of your of your exposure, so then you get a seventy five percent payout or seven hundred fifty million dollars. So there, that's assuming there's damage and there's assuming there's um because it runs on the it runs on the parametric assumption, not necessarily a real a real an adjuster going out looking at it. There's a number of advantages to this uh, type of insurance. Um, payouts happen faster, uh, as because you because uh, you know I don't know how I many you've ever waited for just like a car with hail damage or even a car in a car accident. Sometimes it takes months to get this. With in this kind of, in a parametric in a parametric solution, once the once the agency understands or the company understands that your property was within that was within that radius was within that footprint of wind, fire, flood, or whatever the parametric book is for, it I'm like it triggers a payout of that amount. So uh, as we're seeing in the um, parametric insurance is really is becoming really popular in, in the APAC or Asia Pacific region, um, just simply because it's a quick pay it's a quick payout. And it doesn't require the same amount of infrastructure as classic insurance of an adjuster going out to the field. So if you have a major event, a typhoon hitting Beijing, let's say, you know, you have to send out thousands of adjusters to go out and look at different properties where people get pay out quickly. With parametric insurance, it's just a real quick boom, there it is. Your property was within this, was within this date, was within this footprint. And that footprint is known as the date of truth. And that's part of the contract. So if let's say you agree you use the National Weather Service data, so what would happen would be the insurance company at the end of the end of the event would run the wind footprints run by NF in in NWS and say, okay, your property is within this area, so you get a seventy five percent payout or a fifty percent payout or whatever the whatever your book says. Um, 
but uh, and some and some large organizations have they do have Internet of Internet of Things devices on property, um, flood gauges, wet, uh, their own wind, their own wind instruments and things. And those are and the and the contract typically so those are those are the data of truth. So they utilize those those uh, IoT devices. Um, we kind of joke about what we call the the lawn blo the wind the what the um, uh, the, the leaf blower the leaf blower conspiracy, where people would go out do their IoT device um, with the wind speed and blow a leaf blower into it so they could get a larger payout for fraud. But we have not yet to see that really happen. Um, but parametric insurance is blat is it's almost completely geospatially based because it requires the location of the of the exposure and the footprint and the ver and the distance it was from the, from a particular event. There's also parametric insurance also allows a lot of flexibility within that. We see um, things that are weirdly that are difficult to insure, like coral reefs. Uh, the state of Ala the state of Hawaii has has done a parametric. Um, deal with an insurance company about a coral reef and as the percentage of that coral reef dies off there they do pay us to the local tourism companies um to so, so they so the prop the basically is to to ensure their uh, their lost profits so they 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 don't they don't have to fold up so they could don't so they get this insurance payout based on how much of the coral reef has died as well as stuff like off offshore wind farms how much damage is done by wind storms or flooding or rogue waves all this put into a parametric book because it's a complex situation. It's it's com there's a complexity involved when a new kind of exposure comes up, and um, and this just kind of simplifies the whole process. So, what does the future look like? Um, I've seen the models, uh, including the climate change models, and it currently doesn't look great. Uh, I don't think the future. It, if you look at the models, the future doesn't look bright. The future looks very bleak. And very destructive, um, but I, I really firmly believe that the reinsurance industry is what's going to save us from climate change, and I have a number of reasons why. And at the end of this presentation, we could have a long discussion about this. I've I presented this this, uh, this deck at uh, North Fifty One and talked about this as well, and it had it, it had some very lively discussion afterwards after I brought this up. But since insurers and reinsurers aren't beholden to political interests. And they see the value of investing in uh, startup in startup technologies, various technologies, very resilience technologies, out of the now um, to save them from having to, re to rebuild Miami in 2070. They have the economic motivation to build resilient technologies and resilient and build resiliency within their current books. Uh, as after the Hawaii, after the Maui Hawaii fire, wildfires this past summer. A number of structures that stood had fire safety, had fire safety uh, resilience built in. Uh, metal roofs. They weren't, you know, most, most residential houses weren't built to fire were built to fire standards. But your CVSs and a lot of your businesses were, and they survived. So as an in, insurers are starting to look at that, as we see an increase in the number of wildfires, increase in the number of storms, increase in the number of, the, of violent storms, we'll see more resilience put into insurance contracts and hopefully help protect property and other things moving forward. Um, within the reinsurance community, again, these are the people with the money that support insurers during an event. There is uh, a startup ecosystem within each, 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 each reinsurer that billions of dollars are invested in new technology. Stuff as simple as water absorbing sidewalks. So to help reduce flooding or help mitigate flooding. Uh, fireproof buildings and other and a lot of data science and a lot of AI is going into it uh, go, and a lot of AI concepts into it as well to determine resilience going forward in other AI applications. Um, the big thing in insurance with artificial intelligence is, uh, is our rooftops. Um, after an event, fly you, you fly over the uh, we do what we call a gray sky flight, uh, blue sky versus gray sky. Blue sky is where we collect data. Uh, you know, like everybody else, aerial data constantly. Gray skies within as soon as we can fly after an event. So we fly that using artificial intelligence, where and more or less really computer vision um, to look at the different rooftops to go, okay, here's what it was like before. Here's the damage afterwards, and have the AI algorithm puke out saying, hey, this is this this rooftop is 80% damage. This rooftop is 75% damage. So that way they can help trigger the payout, much like parametric insurance, a lot more fast, a lot quicker. Excuse me. 
than going through and using an adjuster. Um, the problem with this is no one, it hasn't, there hasn't been a lawsuit against a company who's used AI in court yet, but it's coming at some point. And how do you cross examine an, a, a computer vision um, black box? So we'll see, we'll see how that goes. But right now, a number of insurers are using companies. Um, the, there's a big one out of Boulder, the Geospatial Insurance Consortium, um, based off of Excel imagery, who where most, most of the insurers get their imagery from. Also, NextView, BetterView. Um, there's a company called Arturo, which is an AI firm that, that specializes in rooftops and pool detection and loss of various properties. Um, the other things we're doing with AI and insurance is looking for fraud. That's a big insurance thing. Um, going through looking for fraud patterns, as well as um, using uh, uh, natural language processing or you know LLMs like your chat GPTs to be able to build, to be able to generate uh, similar stochastic events on the fly. So the idea is you can cut and paste a NOAA storm storm alert. And that will generate 10 similar events to that. So we could see what that looks like. Um, there's also been a lot of AI work done with, uh, with wildfire and flood. Those are two perils that are difficult to predict. Um, and, and especially flooding is difficult to, to, um, uh, to detect as well, because usually the, unless you're using, unless you have a SAR satellite point out directly at the flood area, it's hard to know exactly when the flood height was because there's cloud cover and there's other things involved. But with wildfire, it's a lot easier to determine where the burn map, where the where the burn scar is. Um, but again, as those grow, as those perils grow, we're using AI more to help us to help cat models evolve into that space where we can be more accurate and be more direct. Um, also, Earth observation huge in insurance right now. Lots of uh, data collection, lots of you know the I don't know if you follow ICI at all out of Finland, but they are are banking on the insurance industry to to support their support their activities in space. Um, Maxar and again like Vexel and Nearmap, they all have it, they have groups that are just completely dedicated to insurance. As the price of this stuff, as the price of remote sensing data comes down, uh, we use more of it uh, because you know at, at the end of the day we're, we we do we do our beholden to our stakeholders have to make a profit, so we can't we can't put up our own satellites and we can't spend billion millions of dollars on it like the, like the feds can. But as the price of as the price of Earth, of Earth observation data goes down, we can utilize it more, making our models more accurate, and making um, and basically be able to dial it in so people understand exactly when when a storm is coming in, or after an earthquake, what's damaged or and what and what could possibly be damaged uh, in, in like a six point scale or, or six point on the Richter scale earthquake in Seattle. Um, lastly, and since I'm speaking to university, uh, this is this is important to me. Uh, we're having a brain drain in the insurance community. Uh, a lot of people don't view it as a viable option when they leave school. I worked in a lot of verticals in geospatial. Insurance is by far the most challenging and interesting of them all because you're dealing with so much geospatial data, so much information, and the, the big data problems we solve are huge and fun. Um, I, I, and I don't understand why people don't see it as an insurance as a, as a viable alternative, although it is like, you know, when you think of an insurance person, you think of someone selling, you know, Geico or, you know, or it's, or something else, uh, kind of a side story. Whenever I have a meeting with a client, I get their jingle stuck in my head. I had a meeting with Liberty this morning, Liberty Insurance, and then in the back of my skull, there's been Liberty, Liberty, Liberty. Um, that's just, that's, that's just uh, occupational hazard. But coming into this, um, if when you're starting out, if you're into climate change, if you're in the, if you're if you're into natural disasters, if you're into this stuff, take a strong look at the insurance industry. There is a lot of stuff going on here that's really cool and a lot of fun, and um, it's for private. It's really rewarding to get to know that you're helping protect people and help people come out of a of a bad, uh, possibly the worst event of their lives in better shape. Um, and that's my presentation, uh, how to contact me. Uh, the best place is on LinkedIn. Um, ever since Musk took over Twitter, it, I haven't been on as much, but my handle over there is uh, Todd F. Barr. Um, and my website is spatialtodd.work. It's, it, it's, forgive it, it's a work in progress. It's, I don't have a lot of, I haven't put as much effort into it as I want to, but you can contact me there. And I have, some, I have a, a few presentations there as well right now, but that's kind of a watch this space sort of thing. 
Um, and now I'll take any questions you have. Thanks, Todd. Um, if anyone has questions, you can put them in the chat or unmute. Hey, Todd, can I ask a question? This is Orla in Denver. No, go for it. Cool. Um, I I have to come back to what you said about reinsurance saving us all from the impacts of climate change. Um, what, like, why do you think the industry is big enough and to to do that? You know, what what steps are going to happen from cost to reinsurance? to actual adaptation, you know, at a more national, regional level, because that's what's required. Right. So, because they see massive loss, reinsurers don't think next quarter, they don't think next year, they think 2070, right? They think 2021, will our company still be viable 100 years from now? So they're willing to invest the money now into those, into those solutions for resilience, to save them, basically, they invest ten billion dollars now. They save one hundred billion dollars in twenty seventy, twenty eighty, when they have to re when they don't have to re rebuild Miami or you know like all the outer banks, mm -hmm. or they don't have to, they don't have to, they don't have to eat those losses. So, and since it's not it's the, since it's an economic driver and not something that requires political will or the change in the you know the changes in the direction of an election, um. Reinsurers, are, I think that reinsurers are the ones who are best positioned for that. And do you think they have enough? So, so like, let's take Miami. Okay. <laughs> flood say flood barriers or something like that. Do they have enough power or will they have enough power to influence, you know, actual infrastructure changes, policy changes to have impacts on their bills five, 10 years from now? So the power structure works like this. The reinsurer pressures the insurer to write in the, into the contract that a certain, let's say a hotel chain, has to build defensible space around their area from flooding, right? So the, in order for an, a, a hotel that's in a major disaster area like Miami, potential for earthquakes and hurricanes, potential for hurricanes and flooding, um, the, the, the company has to be able to, has to meet that insurance, has to have an insurance contract. So the only way they can have that insurance contract is by having the, um, um, the infrastructure built around the hotel. The hotels and the local businesses at that point can influence local le legislation to help, them, to help them build resilience so they can maintain their insurance policy to protect them against the risks. Does that make sense? That totally makes sense. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's why because it just dawned as I would I don't know I was I was going to a conference I I was I was going to the big reinsurance conference in Orlando, and it kind of dawned on me that that's actually how the power structure for that works and how the influence of that would run. Yeah. Yeah. So. Cool. Uh, did you see the chat? No, I did not see the chat. It's from Carlos, first time caller, long time listener. <laughs> how does the recent layoffs in tech impact the brain drain and how does it help with recruitment into this field so we've i have an opening rec i have open rec right now and i've gotten a lot a lot of resumes from your googles and your amazons of people so people are insurance kind of doesn't have the same sort of uh, ups and downs of the standard market uh it's very steady so we have a lot of people, we have a lot more, um, yeah, you know, a lot of people, a lot more people are, are applying for my position than, than, than did last time it was off, than it was open. So I think there's a lot more people looking at it, but I don't know how long they would stick around because as soon as something else comes up, they may leave, right? Or as soon as, as, soon as the economy turns around within the tech field, it may leave. But uh, we, we are getting an influx of data scientists and uh, geospatial professionals within the insurance field right now, though. Uh, I knew I was going to hit with a California question. California is a it's a it's a hard nut to crack, right? 
um, the same thing within California that's happening right now is the same thing that happened with flood insurance back in the, I want to say, 70s and 80s. Uh, so what we're seeing from our point of view, of let's, let's keep it as my personal point of view, is that the only way to really protect California wildfires now, right now, in the current situation, is to have a similar something, something to, the, to the National Flood Insurance Program. Because uh, insurers aren't going into those areas of California that are prone to wildfire because of the increased risks. This is that's just how they're operating. Also, there's a number of things happening in Florida that I just don't want to get into because it's that gets that can get really complicated really quick. But with California, the government's looking into having a since the market no longer provides a service, the government's looking to ha- how to do that. So once that market stabilizes and resilient technologies or resilient infrastructures applied, you'll see the insurance industry come back into that. Everything's running lawn funds. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, but this it's just a matter of this has, but again, that's uh, that's the federal government and they have then they're the ones that supply that, just like FEMA's running low on funds and everybody else's as well. Uh, Erica, what kind of technologies must use in industry? Uh, Arc Pro, Python, or R. So our scientists use whatever they want to use. We have QGIS, Geoda, ArcGIS Pro. Um, people just use straight up R. We have stuff that's coded in Fortran. So our scientists kind of build whatever, then it's up to our software developers to streamline that and make it cloudy. Um, but as far as like skill set goes, there's a lot of a lot of Qs used, a lot of ArcGIS is used. Um, really, what you need are strong stat skills. And with the geospatial edge, um, you'd be you'd be a you'd be a prime candidate. Uh, it's funny we have a we have a consultant group that we call it CCSG. It's our consulting and customer service group. And about of the I don't know I think there's like seventy people in that group. About seven of them have master's degrees either in remote sensing or ge- or geography. So insurance is a very geospatially aware um, vertical as far as like uh, fintech goes. And Erica, if you if you want, you can reach out to me directly. Uh, look me up on LinkedIn, and we can have this, and I can kind of point you in directions of uh, of resources where you can find uh, different positions and things. Hey, Todd, I have two things. One, I'm proud of you for not cringing when you said ArcGIS Pro. Oh, I've 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 buried my hatchet with Desiree. Um, and then my next question was more about the data. Obviously, a model is only as good as the data. So, what? Like, what do the data look like that you use in these models? What? So our, our data, we so our hurricane model has over 750,000 inputs um, of various things. Um, we've taken historic weather data to build the model to affect the, uh, the summer stochastic events. Um, and then from there, uh, our scientists using current, using more recent storms uh, kind of dial in the models. So it's really using historical data and then building a model that simulates that. And these models, like if you take the 10K catalog, it takes like three months to run on a high on a on a high performance computer computing system. So these aren't these aren't little models, these are huge with massive inputs. Uh, we have a sister company called Maplecroft. They do uh, much more ESG stuff, um, environmental, social, and governance. So they do uh, they have this one model. Oh, was it? It's a uh, was it strikes, rebellion, and social, civil commotion. CR SRCC, and um, they have you know millions of inputs that go into this uh, this uh, social model as well. That we use to model you know various terrorist attacks and things. To answer your question, Beth. I said, yeah, I think so. There was another okay. question that came to me in the chat, which I'll just paste in real quick so everyone can see it. Okay. Um, but it says, oops, do you separately model the risk by sector, e.g. ag or industry? Um, could you explain a bit about the quantitative methods to estimate the risk, hazard, socioeconomic, et cetera? Uh, what are the methodologies in the models that are distinguished from academic modeling? That's a lot. Um, <laughs> oh, we got like 15, 14 minutes left. Um, if you can reach me outline, offline, I can get you a book that explains that a lot better than I can. 
Um, but as far as like breaking it down by different sectors, we do break it down by, we do have a agricultural parametric uh, insurance group, um, as well as we have what we call lines. We do basically industries break down into commercial and residential. Um, quantitative met methods, again, uh, there's a lot to that. But for most of the natural hazards we do for the cat modeling, the actual catastrophic modeling, but the, um, um, the hazards are all based on either past events and or past weather systems. And the temporal scale is anywhere from 10,000 years to 100,000 years. Again, we're not going back and seeing what storms are like for 100,000 years. We generate 100,000 years with the storms. And then we can find similar stochastic events to that. So like if a hurricane's coming in, um, you look and it's like, let's say 400 miles off the coast. You can take that storm, take its current parametric values, its distance, its distance, wind speed, current parametric, parametric pressure and path. Using uh, some spatial analyses as well as uh, parametric analysis, you can find out of a 100K catalog, let's say you find 10 similar storms. And then you can look at those storms and you can run the, and run the models and say, okay, these are, this is my potential loss. Then you can break that loss down by the different lines of business. Uh, including agriculture, commercial, or, or residential, even to sort of some, even break it down as far as auto. Um, I mean, no, if you reach again, if you reach me on LinkedIn, I can get you uh, a couple Springer books about that, and um, and that can explain like how the methodologies work much better than I can in like the ten minutes I have left. Uh, and Todd, can you show the screen again with your contact info? Yeah, and then sure. I can also put that in the chat. Just yeah, on LinkedIn, I'm just just look for Todd Barr, and you should be able to find me. But Todd Barr Geospatial. No, it's like the show. All right. Any other questions? Is it showing? Your screen is not showing, but I there we okay. There we go. Yeah. Okay. And I I put it in the chat. Cool. Uh, yeah. Are there any other questions? I think we got all the ones in the chat. Yep. Um, all right. Well, then we can wrap it up, which is good because twelve fifty is when people usually have to go to their next class. For those of you who are here on campus going to class, um, thank you so much, Todd. This is really interesting, really cool, and uh, the AI cats. I think they really. <laughs> Yeah, I actually, I made a, a bunch of cards. I, I put them up in a red bubble and I hand them out at, at work sometime as cards to people. So, yeah. I expect some at Phosphor G in two weeks. Uh, I don't know if I can get them in two weeks. I'll send you some soon. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, yeah, thanks again, everyone, for coming. And uh, check out our event calendar for upcoming events. We have one on October 26th with Vibrant Planet talking about climate change and carbon management strategies or something. I'm not sure. Something like that. It should be really cool. <laughs> All right. So yeah, thanks again, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Have a good rest of the day.